I hope it does. Everybody hear me okay? All right, okay. <clears throat> I don't want to keep you too late tonight. I know Chicago Fire comes on at about 8 or so, so I don't want you to miss that. It's one of my favorite shows. Uh, it's not one of your guys, I, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> All right, my name is, is Mark Deschewitz. Uh, many of you have seen my talks here and elsewhere around town. I'm gonna to be discussing White Pocket. Uh, has anybody been to White Pocket? Ah, great, great. So you all should be familiar with a lot of the uh, geologic features out there. Uh, tonight I'm gonna to be introducing some terminology that may or may not be new to you. Um, I'll try to keep it uh, um, to a minimum number of terms. But I think the ones that I will introduce to you will help you um, understand the area um, more so that when you go out there again, um, it'll, have, it'll be like sprinkling salt and pepper on it, and it'll feel a lot different to you uh, with the information I'll provide you tonight. All right. So White Pocket is located on the uh, Vermilion Cliffs National Monument right here. Here's the Vermilion Cliffs National Monument. It stretches up into, up into Utah as well. All right, a little bit about myself, uh, my journey. I was born in, uh, in the Boston area. Um, my brother and myself had an ideal childhood. Um, I was his, um, I wish I could say I was his mentor, but I was really his tormentor. <laughs> and uh, today he's mine, so we're very close. And uh, yeah, I went out to Illinois and uh, went, attended the uh, Midvale School for the Gifted. And then I went to work in the energy industry. Um, and I moved down to New Orleans and kind of bounced around between Houston and New Orleans for a few decades. I was in the oil industry for about 35 years total, um, including consulting. So, and a lot of the, a lot of the uh, field trips that we would go on would come out here to Utah because the exposures are so wonderful, um, wonderfully exposed. <laughs> uh, in New Orleans, I met my wife. And uh, after Katrina, we decided to move to Ivan's in 2008. So in 2005, we, uh, we struggled through Katrina and moved to Houston because they shut down the New Orleans office. And after about, it felt like three and a half years, but it's really two and a half years, we, uh, we moved out to Ivan's. Spent a little time teaching. Um, that didn't work out too well, as you can see. <laughs> And then uh, we worked for Road Scholar for about 12 years or so, um, off and on. And uh, now we're here talking about White Pocket. I first visited White Pocket in 2009, and I've been intrigued ever since. And I've been learning more and more about it, even up, up until this morning, where I made some new observations and some newer interpretations. All right. So where is White Pocket? Most of you know. Uh, it's about 95 miles as the flow, cri uh, as the flow cries, as the crow flies from, from St. George. Um, this road right here is House Rock Valley Road. It hooks up 89 and 89A. Um, here's a, a map of the area. This is the preferred route to get to White Pocket, which is located right here. Um, you want to have a high clearance vehicle that you can air down uh, so that you don't get stuck, and this is a relatively common occurrence out there, as many of you probably know. Okay, the, the area around the uh, Perea Plateau, which is right here, was subjected to a number of different uh, tectonic uh, episodes. One of them created the Kaibab uplift, or the Kaibab Plateau. You can see the Colorado River kind of going around this large anticline, which is a large compressional feature. And then we had some extension later on that communicated uh, faults and fractures down to these magma chambers, and we had these large volcanic fields uh, produced. So the area of Perea Plateau has been subjected to a number of tectonic events, including one during the Jurassic, where we had compressive forces on the west side of the North American continent. So poor White Pocket has had a rough time um, over the last 190 million years or so. All right, so let's talk about what we're going to discuss this evening. Talk a little bit about the Navajo sandstone. You all know where the Navajo sandstone resides in Snow Canyon. You've all seen it. 
If these blinds are open, you could look right up uh, through the, the windows here and see it. Um, so it's one of the major formations uh, in Utah. It has a lot of economic value. It produces oil and gas as well as water. I'll talk a little bit about uh, observation mapping. We're going to do that together. We'll talk about tectonics and analogs and trace fossils. And then we'll, um, we'll have a synthesis of all the observations we've made as well as an interpretation. And then if uh, people are still present <laughs> at that time, <laughs> Um, it's not too late. I'll fly, uh, have a fly, flyover uh, from YouTube that might uh, give you an aerial view of what you guys have been walking around on out there. Now, uh, this is what we won't discuss. I'm not going to discuss religion or politics, global climate change, fracking, nutrition, personal finance, or parenting methods. Okay. I promise. Okay. All right. <laughs> Actually, global climate change might come up. All right, let's take a look at some of the rocks we'll be dealing with, in particular the Navajo sandstone. This is a stratigraphic column of our area on the Colorado Plateau. Here's the Navajo sandstone. It's very thick. It can be upwards of uh, 650 to 700 meters thick, 2,200 feet max, approximately. It thins over into Moab uh, to about 200 to 300 feet. So we, we're sitting in a large, thick wedge of Navajo sandstone, and I'll show you that in just a minute. At the end of Navajo time, <clears throat> the Kayenta Formation, which is rivers and floodplains primarily, uh, the climate changed. <laughs> it dried up. And we can see mud cracks at that surface. And what happened then is that the Navajo, the area became a huge desert, and the Navajo sandstone was comprised of sand dunes, which resided within that desert. And this is a picture by Ron Blakey. It's a large paleogeographic map of the area. So all of the yellow and all the brown, that's all Navajo sandstone. White Pocket sits right here within that map. This map was made with thousands and thousands of observations by um, university professors, industry professionals, grad students, you name it, and lay people. So that's, that's what the area looked like. We had an ocean to the west. We had some mountains uh, to, the, to the east. And the source of the sand in the Navajo probably came from some of these mountains here. But also, there's, uh, there's more recent work that indicates that it came from, and they'll say it's an Appalachian source, right? You've all heard that? Yeah? Well, uh, the Wachitas are actually part of the Appalachians. They more likely came from the Wachitas if you're, if you're looking at a map of the, the entire continent. So this is how sand dunes work. Here's what's called the Stoss Slope and the Lee Slope or Avalanche Face. And as a dune migrates, the sand marches up this and bounces up this uh, Stoss uh, Face and cascades down the Avalanche Face. And as it migrates with the wind, it leaves behind a trail of cross beds, what's called cross bedding. Your bed at home is flat. Right? So it's horizontal, and these beds cross the horizontal, so that's why they're called cross beds. Make sense? Pretty much. So in this particular example, you can see a sand dune. You can see the cross bedding, so you know the wind is blowing from left to right. Correct? Here's another example. This is what we typically see in the Navajo, large-scale cross bedding. Okay. Which way is the wind blowing? Left to right? Right to left. Left to right, correct, just like this example right here. So the next time you go into Snow Canyon and you see cross bedding, and you want to impress your significant other, you can say, hey, significant other, I bet I can tell which way the wind was blowing during the Jurassic. <laughs> Quite impressive. <laughs> All right. Here's another image of a, of a sand dune. And again, which way is the wind blowing? Left to right, correct? Here's the avalanche face. The avalanche face is migrating in this direction. Occasionally, we'll see ponded water where the water table is exposed in the desert. What do we call those? Oases. What does the Three Stooges call them? A miragi. A miragi, right? Remember that? It's pretty bad, I know. OK. This is a very busy slide, but it, it was in a publication by Gerald Bryant. Gerald Bryant uh, was at Dixie U. I'm not sure where he is right now, 
but he, um, he published a lot of um, information on soft sediment deformation. We're going to see that at White Pocket um, in spades. So this is a map. And do you see these little tadpoles right here? It has a dot and a line. The, the line indicates the direction of the cross bedding in the Navajo. So what it's saying is on all these little, little tadpoles is that's the wind direction from the cross beds. They can tell from the cross beds the wind was blowing from upper right to lower left, up, uh, top to bottom. So when you compile all those, you kind of get a wind direction map from the Navajo, and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. This cross section right here indicates um, from right to left in the Moab area, off in eastern Utah, it's, it's fairly thin, the Navajo, and then it thickens into the St. George area, upwards of 600 to 650 meters thick. And here's a thickness map um, on there. But here's what Jerry had. He had some vectors on there showing the wind direction. I have another map here where you can see a synthesis of all of those little tadpoles, which way the wind was blowing during the Jurassic. In our area, right here, the wind was blowing predominantly from northeast to southwest. In the white pocket area right here, it was blowing from northwest to southeast. The Aztec sandstone in Nevada, same direction that we see uh, up here to the north. So how do you explain that turn well, if you look at a present-day wind map um, within the, the trade wind belt, what you start to see in this area right here, you can see a, a turn in the, in, the, in the wind direction right at the paleo equator, at, right at the equator. We're close to the paleo equator, not right on the paleo equator, but I suspect that it has to do with the latitude position within the Navajo that gives us that change in wind direction. So there's White Pocket. Let's take a closer look. Now, geology, as many of you know, is an observational science. We gather observations, and we utilize the principles of geology, biology, physics, chemistry, and as little math as possible, and we create interpretations, right? Right. And 90% of our time normally is spent compiling observations. We spend a lot of time out in the field and looking at photographs when we get back from the field, looking at, at uh, observations and compiling them. It's usually pretty simple. For instance, here are a couple of young geologists out in the field, and there's a large litter box and a large mouse. And um, so judging by these, I'd say there are big cats in the area. <laughs> Observation, interpretation, right? Right. Here's another. Um, anybody care to comment on this one? What do you think? What's the observation? Oh, that's an interpretation. <laughs> um, what the observation is, is that ice is kind of hung up in the trees, right? Yeah. The interpretation is the water level was higher at one time, and then it dropped. It elevated the ice, and it hung it up in the trees, and then it dropped. So observation and interpretation. And sometimes it's not so simple. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. I can't figure out how he got in or how he's getting out, but he's in. All right. Things, <laughs> I'm, so, I'm I want to make this fun, everybody, so and I keep myself awake at the same time. Um, things aren't always as they appear. We need to uh, take our time and assimilate all the information, um, and gradually, over time, the picture does become clear. Okay. Very different from what you might have originally thought. So let's look at some observations, and, um, and then we'll, we'll lead into the interpretations. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to put most of the pieces of the puzzle together and gradually um, figure out what's actually happening and what happened out at White Pocket. It's really pretty simple, but um, you'll, see, you'll see what some of the observations are. This is probably one of the the best uh, outcrops at, out, at uh, White Park. Has anybody seen this before? You've all seen it? Yeah. Yeah. You'll, uh, you'll, I think you might have a, if you don't understand it already, you'll hopefully have a better understanding when you get there, when we get there. Okay, so we're going to build an observation map to, uh, this evening together. And 90% of our time is going to be spent compiling those observations, okay? All right. So let's start. We're walking from this path. This is the parking lot right here. We're walking toward this feature, which is right here. 
I'm sorry, right here. Anybody want to make a guess? Any observations? Everybody's left foot is raised. Oh. <laughs> this isn't necessarily an observation, but don't ever do it in really hot time with sandals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Be out there in the cool weather. Now's the time to go. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to venture from this, the parking lot here into this area. And it's about a quarter mile from the parking lot into the heart of White Pocket. Most people just kind of hang out here. There's a lot to see right there. Uh, so there's really no reason, um, unless you want to try to do some field reconnaissance, to venture away. But most of this is within a square mile. So that's a really, uh, really neat um, study area. I've been all over the world studying geology, and this is the neatest square mile I've ever been to in my life. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty fascinating. Let's, let's take a look why. This is one of the first terms I'm going to introduce. It's called a rip-up class. Has anybody ever heard of that term? Rip-up class. It's only going to be about four or five terms, and you don't need to remember them, so don't worry. But what a rip-up class is, is a piece of rock that was at least partially consolidated and then subsequently ripped up and redeposited by water currents. Okay, so it was, it was already partially uh, lithified or made into rock. Water rushed over it, ripped it up, and incorporated it into other sediments. And that's what these look like. So these are very these are rounded rip-up class. And because they're rounded, normally pebbles that are rounded, if you're in a stream bed, they've been transported. They've been abraded and transported. Um, at the base, what we see are more angular rip-up class. And that's what those look like. So they didn't move very far, okay? They just kind of got ripped up and maybe moved a few feet. Does that make sense to everybody? The, the rounded ones have rolled around a little bit and got rounded. The angular ones just kind of stayed put. They didn't, they didn't move very far. So that, those are some observations and some interpretations. Also, another big uh, observation is this material up here is different from the material below it. This material it looks like it's disturbed, and this is relatively undisturbed below it. Kind of interesting. You guys have seen this outcrop at White Pocket? The lollipop. Pardon? The lollipop. That's the lollipop. Yep, that's right. Have you guys seen this one again? Here's relatively undisturbed sediments sitting in this massive white sandstone with all of these rip-up class, with, with smaller angular ones at the base and larger ones incorporated into it, into that white sandstone matrix. That's pretty cool. Okay. This is one of my favorite rip-up class right here. Now, my, you have to understand, my wife has been listening to me talk about White Pocket for a long time, okay? <laughs> She'll wake up in the morning and I'm talking about White Pocket because <clears throat> I'm fascinated with the area. And uh, this one's for her, for listening to me for so long. This is my favorite rip-up class right there. Aww. Everybody see that? <laughs> wow, look at that. <laughs> Pretty cool. But yeah, look, at, I mean, that's a huge rip-up class, uh, sitting in amongst that white sandstone matrix. So are you saying that's one big rock? No. Oh, okay. uh, oh this one right here, this rip-up yeah. class? It looks like it's probably a consolidated piece, yeah. It's pretty big, isn't it? One big piece. Yeah. Not a bunch of pieces. But, you know, no, that's uh, probably one big piece. And that's not the biggest one. Okay. I'm going to show you some that are probably 20, 30 feet across in a moment. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. The next one is soft sediment deformation. That one's fairly self-explanatory, right? It's deformation of the sediment while it's soft. So while it's relatively unconsolidated. So that's where you see all this twisting and swirling. That rock, it was not a consolidated rock. It wasn't actually rock, it was sediment. That something happened to it to make it uh, all swirly in that swirly pattern. Pretty spectacular. So soft sediment deformation occurs when forces are placed on unconsolidated sediments. It's deformation that occurs while the sediment is soft. Okay. Here's a good example. This looks like taffy. Just, uh, it's just a mess. It's just got something happened to it to make it um, bend and twist into the current form. All right. The next term is a fluid escape structure. 
and you can see it right here. So when, when rocks are shaken, or I'll tell you a little bit about that, how do they form? Um, basically, during earthquake activity, um, shaking of, the, of waterlogged sediments forces water out of the sediments into what's called a sand blow or sand volcano. Um, and that also can occur from rapid loading. So if you dump a lot of sediment all at once on waterlogged sediments, the stuff just comes up from the side away from that load and it comes up like a volcano, a sediment volcano. Just had a very big earthquake and the result is this is in New, New Zealand. Bubbling out of the garden here. It's not a burst water main or sewage or anything because there are no pipes here. So it's just been pushed to the surface by the liquefaction. All right, liquefaction. What is that? Um, when water rich sediments are shaken, uh, they behave like a fluid. Uh, and the sediments aren't able to support structures. Uh, the result is sediment bubbling to the surface, forming sand volcanoes or sand blows. Has anybody ever seen a sand blow in the Navajo sandstone? Dan, we, we saw some out in, uh, in Kayenta that day, but that was in uh, the, the uh, Moanavi? Or very, very small. They're small. small, small. On the surface, when, you, when you're hiking around in the Navajo, occasionally you'll see little circles with a slightly different color within the Navajo or possibly within the Kayenta. And a lot of times they'll line up along a fracture. They'll line up on a straight line, which means the water came bubbling up along a fracture and formed those little sand blows, little sand volcanoes. So that results in ground failure. And you, this is a picture from China where buildings have basically toppled over because they, don't, they lost the support of the underlying um, foundation due to shaking. Now this is a little video from Iris, and I'm going to have to take it out of presentation mode to play it. So let me see if I can play that. Here we go. Uh, San Francisco 1906 earthquake. Loose granule sediment, it's water saturated, you have strong shaking. And what happens is all that water that's, that's down here, it actually starts to bubble up to the surface. With that load that's sitting on top of it, with the current, with the shaking, you get liquefaction. So the water actually comes up to the surface and the foundation gets destroyed. And here's an actual picture of what that looks like, what that looked like back then. So liquefaction um, basically mixes up all the sediment and allows water to be expelled from the sediment down below. Okay. All right. Let me go back. Okay, so here's an example of some fluid escape structures. Have you guys recognized these out at White Pocket? Has anybody seen them? I bet you have. Um, I'll show you a few here. If you zoom in on this area here, all of these pipes coming up here, those are all fluid escape structures. You can see them here coming from down below. And this material here was actually material that came up along those pipes. And the result, I'm calling this amorphous sandstone caps. I'll get into that in a minute. But this is the result. This is the material that came out of those pipes onto the surface. And that'll become more apparent in just a moment. This is a fantastic outcrop. Um, what you see here is soft sediment deformation, SSD. Here's the legend right here. And we're going to see an FES, fluid escape structure, right here. And the water came up with the sediment and resulted in these uh, amorphous sandstone up at the top. So that's a, a very dramatic fluid escape structure. Material came up and got deposited at the surface. Amorphous sandstone. Amorphous means without form. Amorphous. Morph means form, like Power Rangers. Amorphous means without form. The Navajo sandstone typically is cross-bedded, right? You see a lot of cross-bedding in it. This doesn't have cross-bedding in it. It was like it was deposited as a mush out there. Um, it occurs as mound shapes, like this right here, or blanket deposits sitting in here. Um, sometimes you see these vertical beds below it. This is a fluid escape structure sitting here that dragged the beds up and all the material spewed out onto the surface. That's an interpretation. Over how long a period? In about 10 seconds. <laughs> oh, the whole thing was built in 10 seconds. 
Yeah, this, this, didn't, this happened in a geologic instant, and we'll, I'll explain why in a second. I think it'll become apparent to you. Maybe not 10 seconds, maybe 11. Uh, and sometimes the amorphous sandstone contains these rip-up class within them, okay? So here's the amorphous sandstone cap sitting above a big fluid escape structure right here. Sitting in the background, you can see the amorphous sandstone like climbing up. You see the, the disturbed and the undisturbed sitting below. <coughs> it's a mess out there, but it's an organized mess. It's an organized mess. This is a fantastic uh, outcrop. This is from a drone, a drone photo. And what you see is soft sediment deformation, SSD. You also see a fluid escape structure. In fact, this is the entry point right here. That is the pipe. It's all eroded back now, but that is the pipe. And that material came up. And look at this feature. It looks like a little lacolith. You're seeing one, one section of that lacolith that came in there. And all this material here was spewed up onto the surface. So the fluid is another fluid escape structure over here that's responsible for all of this white sandstone. Nice rip-up class. Same things, rip-up class, fluid escape, and soft sediment deformation. And amorphous sandstone. Ah, another, another term. It's just cross-bedding terminations. What we see here is amorphous sandstone, and we see it here as well. And then right Right there is a fluid escape structure, and this termination, this is cross-bedding termination into the amorphous sandstone. An observation. Does it mean anything? Yeah, I think uh, we'll, we'll see in just a few minutes. Here's another uh, example right here. So here are those cross-bedding terminations into the amorphous sandstone. It's pretty neat. What does it mean? I think, I think we have a pretty good explanation for it. So here's a, here's a view, what, we, what we've seen so far. Soft sediment deformation, amorphous sandstone. Small to large class, fluid escape structures, and cross-bedding terminations. So we're building, we're building a catalog of observations out here. So that eventually, um, it will make sense as to what exactly happened. All right, so we're going to go over here. So most people, when they go out to White Pocket, they kind of hang out in this area right here. But well, we're going to venture a little bit, uh, about a quart, four tenths of a mile from the parking lot out to this ridge right here. And, um, but first, are there any questions? Yes. It's water and sediment. Um, yeah. But from this, in this area, it's, um, what were you thinking? Well, I knew it wasn't lava, but... Right, I'm right. I'm not sure I understand. See, she doesn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, it's sediment and water that's being expelled from, this, from the subsurface. So the water table had to be either exposed in oases or just below the surface. Yes? And the white, is that because the sandstone has been bleached from the water? Ah, <laughs> It's a topic that's near and dear to my heart, <laughs> bleaching. It, um, I, don't, um, I don't adhere to the bleaching hypothesis. Sorry. Uh, I believe if you drop the bee, I'll be on board with you. Uh, it's really leaching. Um, yeah. Uh, there are a lot of um, carbonate cements within the Navajo sandstone, magnesium carbonate and calcium carbonate, dolomite and calcite. Not, not entirely, but just enough that the iron coatings, the iron cement in that, uh, sem in that sandstone, when, when you have cold water percolating down through the sand, um, it contains a lot of carbonic acid, CO2. CO2 in water contains carbonic acid. It creates carbonic acid. So when that water percolates, acidic water percolates down through the Navajo, it gets chemically weathered. So a lot of this white sandstone, I know there are other ideas out there, but I believe that it's chemical weathering that's causing it out here. Snow Canyon's a totally different beast, and uh, that's the topic of a totally different talk uh, one day. Yeah. So it's leaching. Um, I know that uh, a lot of academics will call it bleaching, but when I think of bleaching, I think of my genes, tie-dyeing and stuff. Um, we're not doing that here. Yes, sir? I, I can't get my arms around the rip-up class, the size. Yeah. All I can say is, all I can, all I can say is, you haven't seen anything yet. So hang with me. They do get so they had to be lithified and transported, right? Yeah. How did they do that? Inland Cretaceous Sea. 
Have you ever been in a flash flood like in Capitol? You ever see any uh, Capitol Gorge uh, or um, Brand Wash um, flash floods? You'll see boulders floating, actual boulders floating. So these are like flaps of rock, semi-consolidated, that are rafted down you know, with the water. It'll, it, hang with me. I, I know I'm going to answer your question eventually. Yeah, you read my abstract. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, we're in the inter we're, we're going to try to stay away from the interpretation phase right now and just stick with the observations. At least I'm going to try. So, questions? Good questions. Thank you. Um, this guy, can you give me an example of an incomplete sentence? The convict escaped. It's an incomplete sentence, right? <laughs> Convict escaped. Okay, all right. All right. <laughs> Corny. But everybody's awake, right? So it's effective. Okay, so again, we're over here. We were just sitting in, in this area right here. We're going to walk about uh, 0.15 miles to this side of this ridge. And this is what we see. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? What do you see? You see uh, a disturbed and undisturbed uh, area, right, above that line. This is relatively undisturbed. You can look at cross bedding in there, and you can tell which way the wind was blowing, right? OK. Well, what do we see above it? Amorphous sandstone, right? What else? Rip-up class? These are large. These are large rip-up class. Soft sediment deformation. And we see uh, fluid escape structures. So we're seeing the same types of things farther away from the area that most people stick with, uh, stick around in. Here's the, other, the view of the other side of it. And what do you see? Well, I see relatively undisturbed material here uh, with, overlying, um, uh, dis with disturbed material overlying it. We also see what? Soft sediment deformation, amorphous sandstone, there are rip-up class up in here. So all those same things, we're seeing the same things over and over and over again out there. What does it all mean, Basil? Okay. What it means is that this material, if you get up close here, what you can see is that this material right up in here, it looks like a freight train crashed into a hillside. This stuff is all piled up against that, this, this relatively undisturbed material. It came down from somewhere and rest came to its final resting stop place right up here. And here you can see again the uh, disturbed residing over the relatively undisturbed rocks. All right. So it looks like we can see um, disturbed, the disturbed uh, over undisturbed. We see a lot of the same material up in here with a directional overprint. It looks like it's coming somewhere from this direction up here. So it would be logical to go look, right, up there. But first, was this material transported? Whenever you compile observations, you start to come up with questions that everybody's asking now. How large are the rip-up class? How could they possibly float that far down, away from wherever? Uh, how do you do that? I mean, lots of, lots of really good questions start to come up. Um, if so, what triggered the event? Why did they come down in a torrent of material, what it looks like to be a, a very quick event? And where did it come from? So let's go over here. We're going to go across. This is actually a fracture right here with a really nice exposure. But on the way from here to there, what we see is this material here. So we're walking in this direction and all that darker material. When you look at it, what does it look like? Rip-up class, right? We are loaded. I mean, it is literally a, a trash field of rip-up class everywhere. So we're on the trail. We're tracking down the provenance of where that material come, came from. We have a general direction, but we're not sure yet. So we get to the top of this hill right here, and we're looking at this wall right here, and this is what we see. 
See some massive sandstone. There are some petroglyphs down there. Uh, if you've ever been out there. Have anybody seen the petroglyphs of the big horn? Yeah. Then we have this material here, which looks like uh, normal Navajo sandstone with cross bedding in it. And then we see this. Have you all noticed this? Massive sandstone. We're not used to seeing that. We're used to seeing cross-bedded sandstone in the Navajo, oh, correct? So that's not what we're seeing here. We're seeing massive sandstone. Anybody notice anything different about this massive sandstone, especially this unit up here? Let's look at that surface right there. Let's zoom in on it. What does it look like to everybody? Look at that sur let's look at that surface right there. Does it look like it's cutting down into the material below? Yeah, it looks like it's actually eroding the material below it. And it's thick. How thick? Well, <clears throat> this gentleman right down here is six feet tall, and his name was Jim Beller. Everybody know Jim Beller? Yeah, okay. Jim's a great guy. So if we stack up Bellers, it's 11 <laughs> Bellers. 11 bellows, so that's 66 feet, a little, as little math as possible, right? That's what, I, that's what I said. So that's a 66 foot section of solid, massive sandstone that's not cross bedded. That's different. That is very different for the Navajo sandstone. Let's look at this area right here. What do you see? What are these things? It was a rip-up class, right? Yeah. yeah. Those are like, uh, some of them are 20 to 30 feet across. They're f like flaps that just kind of rolled around at the base of that massive sandstone. So we have large rip-up class. Have we seen that before? Well, yeah. And we saw it right here, <laughs> right up in here. So we see these large rip-up class, and then we see them at the base of this massive section here. So what you see here is a large scour feature in the Navajo sandstone. This is, this is a, almost a 66-foot deep canyon in the Navajo that got filled in with massive sandstone. That gives me goosebumps because it's not very common in the Navajo sandstone. In fact, this is the only place I've ever seen it. And uh, there are people that, that have worked in Navajo for many, many years, and this is one of the more spectacular examples of an actual scour feature within the Navajo. It's about 825 feet wide. It's a big, big feature. There's also a massive sandstone down here, which could be another one of those scour features within the Navajo. Wow. All right. So now we have scour features, large rounded class, directional overprint. We kind of think that those class that we're seeing and that all that white sandstone might be coming from somewhere, possibly that big channel. And there you go. Okay. Are we done yet? Well, no, we're not. We have more. <laughs> Let's look right here. This fluid escape structure sits right here. If you look at where they all are. There are lots of them. There are at least 14 or 15 of these uh, over across the white pocket area. And you, you don't have to use Landsat. You just go out there and there are many more than what I'm showing here. And they're sitting uh, on the flanks of these rip-up class. So this is where all those rip-up class are, right here and here. Interesting observation. Oh, and wait, there's more. Um, have you all seen these? Yeah. Um, this is kind of like, uh, it doesn't really help the interpretation at all. It's kind of like having a nicely folded napkin with a, a good meal at the table. Just something else that makes the, the table look nice. Um, that was a bad analogy. But <laughs> these are, these are uh, interesting imp impressions. Um, lots of people have speculated what they are, what they aren't. Uh, I'm not going to get into that tonight unless I'm really quizzed about them. I'll give you my thoughts. So let's look at a summary of the observations. We see soft sediment deformation and am amorphous sandstone. Our rip-up class, large and rounded, small and angular, fluid escape structures, cross-bedding termination, 
large uh, scour like features with large, very large rip up class at the base of that channel feature, uh, disturbed over uh, undisturbed, um, possibly a provenance. It's showing you a direction of, of um, input and a lot of conical features and possibly and some impressions in the sandstone. So in order for all this to happen, the deformation would have had to have occurred during Navajo time, at the very close to or just after the time of deposition, because the sediment was not consolidated at that time, right? And it usually takes place where there's a plentiful supply of water, but wait, the Navajo is described to be, as being deposited in the desert. Deserts typically don't have a lot of water in them, right? Well, previous workers have seen signs of life in the Navajo desert, plant life, insect burrows, tracks, and traces relatively common, especially out in this area in Coyote Butte. And it looks like some kind of triggering mechanism would have been needed to create these kinds of features that we see out here. Any questions now? No? Hmm, well I have a question. What combines with antimatter to create a violent reaction? Uncle Matter. That's, as, that's probably as good as it gets. So, all right. So let's take a look at a couple of these premises here. Um, plentiful water. Um, in order for geologists to establish credence in their ideas, we need, uh, and we use present day analogs or analogs that are very well documented from the past. So that's what we, we typically try to find. Um, so the question you have to ask, are there any modern day dune complexes which have a lot of water associated with them? And the answer is, well, let's take a look at um, the north, northern coast of Brazil. Right along the coast there, there are coastal dunes in, in dunes in what the, uh, is called the Brazilian Sahara. The Lensua Maranhensis uh, National Park. Beautiful white sand dunes, and look at all that water in there. Hmm, that's because they have seasonal rainfall uh, up to about eight inches in the spring, mainly, and uh, the water pools between the dunes. Hmm, and this is what uh, one of them looks like, the pooled water, the cross bedding coming down into the oasis, right? Hmm, I wonder if that's what we have here. That's an interpretation. So are there any modern day sand dune complexes that have a lot of water associated with them? Yeah, there are. What about a triggering mechanism of some kind? Well, yeah, what was the triggering, me triggering mechanism? What would we be looking for if there was one? Well, during this time, during the Jurassic, what we know is that the North Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico were opening up. So we had rifting going on in this part of the Atl North Atlantic Ocean. If we have rifting going on on this side of the continent, what's happening on this side? Subduction. So we have extensional forces on the east coast, and on the west coast we have compressional forces. Okay, so we have tectonism, and what we're going to look for are evidence of earthquakes during the Jurassic. And what should we look for for evidence of earthquakes during the Jurassic? Well, we're going to look for buried faults. Faults that are confined to the Jurassic. That's what you'd like to see. <coughs> and this is what you see out there. It's pretty. And they terminate right up in here. They, don't, they do not go all the way up through the section. So this records a Jurassic age, Navajo age uh, earthquake event that likely shook the material above it and created something that was going on, which it'll become apparent in a minute. Uh, so here's White Pocket. This is uh, from Siler, uh, 2008. He did a lot of work in the Coyote Butte area with Marjorie Chan. And uh, this is one of the faults that is truncated in, within the Navajo. And this is called a sin depositional fault. You can see the thickening across the fault. So this fault was active at the time of this deposition because it's thickening. So there was a step here that thickened um, with sand uh, as, it, as it migrated across. It's kind of like if you had steps and you were blowing sand across it, you'd see the uh, material filling in the steps, and that's what was happening here. So there's evidence of Jurassic Age earthquake activity in this region. 
So that was likely the triggering mechanism that triggered the, um, the deformation. So here's the bottom line. <clears throat> Earthquake activity created slope instability on the flanks of a topographic depression that contained water. Uh, there were perched water tables up within the Navajo. Uh, it's very common in modern day deserts. The dune collapsed uh, and it breached the perched water tables, releasing a torrent of water in what can best be described as a flash flood, I think someone mentioned it over here, of sand and rip-up class. And you can see them here. The rapid loading of these materials created world-class examples of soft sediment deformation and sand volcanoes, uh, much greater than what you see here. This is a passive sand blow, relatively speaking. What we see are massive, massive um, soft sediment deformation and sand blows. Now, how do you do that? How do you make them so large? You saw the little small scale sand blows um, in New Zealand. This was different. I'll show you why. So what we're looking at here, this is the area where that big channel was. What happened when, during an, uh, one of the earthquakes, one of the earthquakes, is that material came down. This is where all the rip up class are. Came down from two directions and filled in these these troughs. When it did that, it actually compressed the sediments here, creating these sand volcanoes all around the perimeter of where the sand, um, sand was deposited. So it compressed, it loaded that area really fast. I mean, this was maybe 15 seconds. It happened. You shook it, it came, came down slope and just compressed the, the heck out of the uh, sediments, expelling the water up along its flanks creating all of these sand volcanoes that look like this. But wait, there's more. Remember we were talking about this. Look at this, look at this area right here. I think I have a zoom in. That material, it looks like it was a freight train that crashed. All the material came down slope and piled up against, uh, against itself. And that's why you have this disturbed material sitting on, over undisturbed. But if you go over here, what do you see? It was sitting right over here, undisturbed, with disturbed sitting on top of it. So that implies another source, right, coming from this direction. So is there another channel that created this debris pile? Well, let's take a look. So we were looking at this area right here. So that channel system was right in here. And we're looking at those rip-up class and all those sand volcanoes are sitting right in here. So they're still present on the surface. And now we're looking at this material right out in here. And then we look right here, and what do we see? Let's zoom in on it. Everybody see it? Right here. Can you see the surface right here? I believe that's another channel right there. And then look right here. Everybody see this one? This one's even nicer. That's a channel sitting right there. So there's more to see out here. So we need a trip. <laughs> we need to go. We need to go look at these, because I don't think any of this material has been seen. Um, in fact, I don't think many, many people have seen the original channel that I described to you uh, earlier. So these, these features out here, I believe, are responsible for um, all the, the liquefaction that occurred during a, a one or two or three earthquakes that occurred out in this area. Marjorie Chan at the U of U has estimated that there's somewhere between a six and a seven on the Richter scale uh, that would create this level of liquefaction. So that's pretty cool. I'm gonna show you an overflight here. Just uh, to see if I, if I can play it. No, it, won't, it doesn't wanna play unless I'm out of play mode. So let me, let me do this. I'm gonna show just a, about a minute of this just to kind of show you what the area looks like. I got permission to show this tonight from Jeff Hodges. Just to give you an idea of what it looks like from the air, just for, just for a minute or two. See a lot of rip-up class? Look at these sand volcanoes, remnants of them.
undisturbed sitting on top of the undisturbed sitting way out there. See this little tunnel here? That's a big fluid escape structure. So if, if you want to read a little bit more about what I showed you this evening, there's an abstract out there. Just Google my name, uh, White Pocket. This was um, from 2011 in the Cheyenne Rocky Mountain Division of the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. You can read a little bit more about it and maybe combine what I mentioned tonight with what you're reading and I think a lot of it will make sense to you. So what we did tonight was we looked at lots of pieces and we put together a picture that I think you might be able to understand this outcrop a little bit more based on what you've seen. That's, at least that's my hope. Um, you can see the amorphous sandstone overriding the relatively undisturbed section here. Lots of rip-up class within it. Um, and I think you might have a better understanding of why that happened, how it happened, and how fast it happened as well. Okay. And I think that's, that's it. Um, be more than happy to entertain uh, questions. If you, if you want to email me, you can at, at this email address. Uh, if you want to get a trip together to go out to White Pocket uh, and you want uh, someone um, to accompany you uh, with a little bit of no. wherewithal about, about the area, uh, I'd be more than happy to consider going. So with that, I will say finite. Question back there. Yes. Yes. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of compressional, um, there, are, there are folds out there related to the severe um, orogeny, which I mentioned earlier, um, that compressive stage uh, created a lot of that folding out there. But then um, you had basin and range tectonics going on as well, where you started to extend the area. So a lot of those old faults that were like this, compressional, they started to back off and you actually had relaxation of those old faults. So you'll see that out there. But that's all related to the most recent part of the uh, tectonic history, not the Jurassic, but the uh, severe and the latest, the uplift of the Colorado Plateau timing. Yeah. You had a question? Yes. Uh, now, all your channels, they were catastrophic? They're yeah. They're, they're, they're not paleo channels that were there. They're it looks like they were catastrophic failure of the dune complexes. Some of those dunes in the area were on the order of a couple of hundred feet high. If you've got perched water tables up within them and you start shaking them and that water and sand combine, they come down slope in a hurry. So um, yeah, this stuff happened in a geologic instant. In a human uh, time scale, it happened very, very quickly, like a flash flood would here. And this is upper Navajo? This is, this is all, uh, this particular part of it is probably um, within, the, within the Navajo, uh, out at White Pocket. It's somewhere in the middle of the Navajo. I'm not sure where, how much section is present below it right there. Yeah, Dan. Mark, if you walk away from this area, is there evidence of any, of this type of activity occurring, or is it just pretty much limited to this area? No. If you walk away a couple of miles, is it all undisturbed now? No, you know, it's it's good, really good question, Dan. If you go over to Coyote Butte and the wave, um, you can see in that area, there's a zone that is extremely deformed. And there are, there are evacuation, there are, there are water evacuation features over there as well. So that, it, within, within, if you go over to the wave or South Coyote Butte, you can see a deformed zone 
with all kinds of material that got ejected out during those those uh, those events. So that's How far more away is that from about six miles, six or seven miles away. That's about it. But we see it here. I can see it. I can see evidence in Zion. I can see evidence of, of um, earthquake activity within the Navajo in Zion. I see it in Snow Canyon. Recently, I, I saw a little bit of soft sediment deformation there. Uh, we see it in Moab. I mean, it's present in the Navajo, and soft sediment deformation is of varying scales. This is the end member of soft sediment deformation out at White Pocket. There are varying degrees of it all across the Colorado Plateau that record these, um, these events, uh, the earthquake events. of... I'm different sorry? events, do you think? Or are they I, I think, one large event, or... I think there were probably... Based on the channeling, that I, the, the, the big um, down cuts, I suspect that there were many small quakes that, um, that breached those perched aquifers that um, provided that rush, that flash flood of sand and, and rip up class uh, to, to that, then the weight of that just compressed the heck out of the sediments and just bowed up the, the flanks of it and created those very large um, sediment volcanoes that you see. Yeah, pretty spectacular. Yeah, that, this is, this is the, the end member of soft sediment deformation. You don't see, see this too often. Um, when, I first, when we first moved here in 2008, the BLM Jeepers um, approached me and they said, hey, Mark, we'd like to take you out to White Park. And I said, hey, sure, I'll go along. And we went out there and, you know, I felt like Frank Barone from um, Everybody Loves Raymond fame. Remember what his famous phrase is? You know it, you just don't want to say it. It's holy crap. Yeah. I mean, it was, I was just... I fell in love with the area. My wife and myself have been out there. We took our son out there. Hopefully, I'll be able to take my brother-in-law out there soon. He's been wanting to go. So, uh, you know, it, it's just, um, it's a fascinating classroom to compile observations. And most people that go out there will stay, you know, you, you drive three hours to get there. You get three hours back. You're tired. You want to get back home. If you don't venture away from that, that local area, you're not going to see the channels. You're not going to see the ridges with all of the, all the uh, disturbed material. You're not going to see the, the transport of material um, away from those large channels. So when you go out there, next time you go out there, roam around a little bit farther from that central area that's so captivating. Um, it really it, it holds you there. Um, but try to, try to venture out to the extremities, and I think you'll be uh, pleasantly um, surprised. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Hey, can you put the slide of the most recent group of fallen dinosaurs up? Yeah. You know, what's, uh, your opinion of? So you want my impression of the impressions? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, dinosaur tracks are not uncommon in, in Coyote Butte. Uh, they're, they're, they're all over the, the area within the Navajo. You can see them on Moab. You see them on uh, Coyote Butte. So the area has water. In fact, Winston Seiler, I believe, what he did was he tracked, he, he took the azimuth of a lot of the tracks that he found, the direction of them, and what he found was that they were perpendicular to the Navajo wind direction. And the way he interpreted that, and this was years ago, he thought that the dinosaurs were migrating from oasis to oasis to oasis in search of water and vegetation. Um, to eat, and there are carnivore tracks as well as herbivore tracks. Uh, this particular one, the ones we see, um, are controversial. Um, there are varying ideas about what they are. They could be dissolution um, pockets, uh, but they don't line up with the fracture patterns in the area, so I kind of didn't agree with that one. Um, cattle. Uh, footprints, but there are clear indications that they were made by, in the Jurassic. What you see on a footprint is you see um, when, when, a, when an animal steps and is moving forward, it has like a the, the footprint has a slope in it and it forms a little furrow in front of it. And you see those on some of these footprints. The sand was so waterlogged, however, that the preservation is so poor that nobody can make a definitive um, guess as to if they really are dinosaur tracks. I personally think. It's not unusual. To, it wouldn't be unusual to find them there within the Navajo, given the amount of water and given that you see them over in Coyote Buttes and to the south of there. Because there's tail drags there, too. I haven't seen the tail drags, but uh, that's cool. 
Send me a picture. You got my email address. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yes. Sang the town today. Yeah. And we had a uh, dinosaur guy. Paleontologist. Andrew Milner. And uh, he said that the tail would not drag unless it was broken. Ah. Huh, maybe it happened during the earthquake. Maybe the tail broke during the earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> <It> fell. <laughs> so that was my question. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I've seen tail drags before, but usually on a sauropod, they're not dragging their tail. Uh, usually it would be on a, on a, um, a pteropod would drag a tail because of their, their stature, the way they're, so yeah. Good point. Yes, question. What is it? You mentioned the Appalachian. Yeah. Uh, oh, as far as the source for the Navajo sand? Yeah, some recent work indicates that there are some zircons, there is some mineralogy that indicates that they, that might be um, a source of the sand. But when, when the Appalachians formed, what happened was um, they formed from the north, and then they rotated in and formed the Wachita's as well. So the Wachita is kind of an east-west running range, and I suspect that that's part of the Appalachian orogeny, but I suspect a lot of the sediments came from the, from the Wachita's. So they're, they're associating mineralogy, the, the zircons, with um, materials that they find within the Appalachians. Is that correct? From the back yeah. Yeah, that sounds kind of wild, I know. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm a proponent of it, but it is a long distance to carry sediment, isn't it? Um, there are local sources that could provide uh, sources of the sediment as well, but that's the current idea. But good, good question. Don't have a real definitive answer. I know there were some more questions. Ah, yeah, yes. This uh, polygonal fracture pattern. Oh, my goodness. Can you explain that? The polygonal, polygonal, polygonal fractures. Does anybody know what, what, uh, how those form? Dan? <laughs> what do you think? I've seen are usually in, in tail also embedding in Yeah, like if, you, like if you go out to Checkerboard Mesa? Like Checkerboard Mesa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Checkerboard Mesa, is, I think, is, is one of those misunderstood outcrops. Um, and we see checkerboarding in a lot of places, not just at Checkerboard Mesa. I think Checkerboard Mesa is, a, is, a, is the intersection of the depositional fabric of the Navajo coupled with the tectonic fabric of the extension. That's my opinion. I know people think that it's weathering. Um, and but I think in that particular example, that's what that is. But I, I just happened, let me just see if I can, um, that was a really good question, Mr. Kelly. Huh, polygonal cracks. <laughs> just happened to have that. So, yeah, so, you know, Mr. Mr. Kelly decided to uh, open, a, <laughs> open a can of worms here. So this is from Marjorie Chan's work, and she's of the opinion that that these polygonal cracks are due to, um, well, let me, let me talk about it a little bit. She believes they're weathering features, uh, that they're all near surface, pretty much near surface. They don't go very deep. Um, and it's hypothesized that they're related to thermal contraction and expansion, primarily on the north face of a lot of these exposures, uh, where you see the most temperature variation. Uh, possibly precipitation changes, dehydration of minerals, or salt precipitation or dissolution. Uh, but she believes that mainly these are the two uh, primary sources that could um, create these. And she sees similar features on Mars um, as well. So she's attributing things on Mars to be related to weathering, et cetera. Okay. Um, I think that that could be, could be in part what's happening here. However, however, <laughs> this is an exposure of um, that amorphous sand sitting on top of this material right here. See this offset? You don't see the offset down below, but these, these types of faults, they, they, they scissor. So depending on where you are, you can have a fault that can reverse throw along its strike, okay? So you could have something like this going on there, and you wouldn't see much, if any, um, offset down below. So here are those, those fractions. You don't really see a whole lot of offset on them. So, I'll say that those are primarily um, extensional fractures, 
And, and Marjorie um, at the U of U might say that those are related to weathering. And I, I would say that, you know, it's possible. It's definitely possible. Um, here's another exposure. Um, there's Jim. Um, and what you see up here, these are some of those fractures at the surface. Um, and you see some over here as well, and we'll get to that in a second. And you can see the offset, they, they go pretty deep. And not only, they go down into the Jurassic. The, these are Jurassic Age faults that, that don't make it up into the upper part of the section. So these, these happen during the Jurassic. So those are related, and they're connecting up with weathering features at the surface. So there appears to be a connection between some of these Jurassic Age faults and those features at the surface. I'm going to zoom in on this one right here because this is, this is a cool exposure here. Um, when you look at it, what you see, look at this little white bed. You see some offset in those? Yeah, right there. And you can hook them up with features at the surface. And these are Jurassic. These are Jurassic Age faults. They happened while the sediment was soft. You can see that there. And they're coming up to the surface and they're exposed at the surface. So, so oh, okay, well, that's interesting. Now, we know we had Jurassic um, thrusting going on to the west of us during, during Navajo time. When, it, when the North Atlantic was opening up, we had thrusting on this side. This is also from Marjorie. And, but we also had this going on. We had compression that formed the Kaibab uplift, right? And then we had the creation of the basin and range and the, the uplift of the Colorado Plateau where we extended the crust. So this area has been, has been active tectonically for a long time. And the Jurassic Faults may be what I'll, I'll call the tectonic dictator. It, those are the, it created the, the pre-existing zones of weakness that were reactivated during the Cretaceous and the Eocene. Okay, so it's possible that you could see that. Now what I did here, I looked at just a Landsat photo. Here's White Pocket right here. And I just kind of drew in a lot of these lineaments that you see here. So you see a lot of lineaments that are occurring at the surface. Then I took those lineaments and I placed them on, oh, that's not a very good picture, uh, exposure at the surface of some of those polygonal fractures. And there is some degree of alignment between the regional fractures and what we see in those polygonal fractures, some degree. So it may be that um, what you see here, it may be that the tectonic history may have also played a role uh, in the development of those polygonal cracks. That's, that's what I think, um, for what it's worth. Does that help explain? It's not a definitive answer. I think, I think it, you know, it's kind of like you, know, you go to the doctor and he says, oh, you got, you got high blood pressure, you know, cut out the salt. Well, no. You, know, you want to do other things, too, to get your blood pressure down. It's not usually one thing that'll, that'll explain something, why you're, why you're experiencing something. And I think the same thing is going on here. All right. Thank you for the question. Obviously, that was the can, can of worms I was expecting. <laughs> Any others? Yes. So when you take people out, you're staying in Nevada for two days? Or yeah, I'd love to be able to camp out there. Yeah. One day, is, it doesn't, doesn't do it justice. Yeah. yeah. It's just, um, there's a lot to see. But uh, there's a lot of wildlife out there, too. So you've you got to go prepared. Um, <laughs> or any cattle, you could get trampled at night. So you've got to be careful. <laughs> Careful. Well, I really enjoyed um, speaking with you guys. Oh, yes, you have a question. Yes, yeah. I was wondering if some of the sand from the Navajo could have come from the, the red rocks east of Denver. That it, area. The ancestral Rockies? Yeah, it very well could, yeah. The question was, could some of the sand have come from the ancestral Rockies? Um, and it's, it is possible, yeah. That was one of the sources that I've always thought. Uh, it could come from. But I think there are numerous sources. We see a difference in the mineralogy within the Navajo, so I suspect there's more than one source. Uh, there are probably many sources. From, from Wyoming? Right? Possibly. Possibly, yeah. And to the east. And to the southeast. The Kayenta we know came from the southeast uh, based on paleocurrent directions. Um, and it's likely that things just didn't change. 
I think the I think the Kayenta came mainly from the Wachita's, or people will call them the uh, extension of the Appalachians. So it's likely that some of the Navajo came uh, from there as well. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. No stupid questions. No stupid questions. No Uh, as far as I know, during, during the Jurassic, there wasn't, um, I have never seen any um, Jurassic Age glacial uh, deposits. I'm sure they exist, but I've never worked them. Um, I've seen some younger ones in the Permian. Um, I'm sorry, older ones in the Permian, but I have never seen um, any during the Jurassic. Um, could it have affected precipitation in the area? I, I don't know. but. Yeah, I don't think there's any link that, I, that I've ever seen. Good question. Who's been up on um, Hell's Backbone, going over to over Boulder Mountain? You've heard this. What are those uh, boulders supposed to be? Glacial? Yeah. I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, you have a question? There's another question here? No? Somewhere in there, I've read it. Wasatch faults coming down, that we've got all kinds of liquid, and we'd have that same thing you talked about. Liquefaction. So, uh, so, so like Valley could be co covered with water. Hmm. Well, it, it's very possible that groundwater yeah. uh, could be connected along the Wasatch. Um, reservoirs could be you know, hooked up along the fault, and there could be water coming up along it. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know anything more about well, I know water. I that's one of the reasons why we have potential earthquakes all around Hurricane in that area is because of the faults in the water underneath. Well, the, in the Hurricane area, you, you're, you've got the Hurricane Fault, which is, that is the actual western edge of the Colorado Plateau. Okay. So that is the edge of the plateau, and that fault is active. There's like five to 7,000 feet of offset on it, and uh, it's also where the EMS uh, uh, station is for Hurricane, right on the fault, right or close to it. Not, not the best place for it. Uh, that's like putting Fukushima, you know, in, the, in uh, Japan. But, uh, but yeah, by the, so when, you, when you're driving through Laverkin, you've all driven through Laverkin, um, you're driving along the Hurricane Fault. And who's noticed anything pe peculiar about the area as you're driving through? Anybody? Shifts. Hmm? Say again? Shift. It's, yeah, there's a shift there. Any, any, olfact, any olfactory observations? Yeah, there's, there's, there's hot springs along there, along the fault. That's right. And um, a lot of people will drive through there and they'll, and they'll, they'll uh, roll down the windows because they think something's going on in the car. <laughs> that's not the right thing to do. Keep the windows rolled up and keep it down to a minimum. Just a little you know, strategy for you guys as you're going to Zion. <laughs> anyway, well, if there's no more questions, I really enjoyed it. Um, if you have any questions, email me and uh, hope to see you again soon. All right. That was the question, the tail drag question? The tail dragging. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Okay, I was hoping totally off topic. Hmm. We just came back and enjoyed that drive on 17. Excellent job. Oh, I'm glad, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And, um, May I interrupt just for a second? I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you so oh, much. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Good, good. I look forward to it. You're very welcome. In the pleasure. This, pleasure. You know, it's my understanding. Oh, sorry. My father was a water witcher. Really? And he claims that there's water, big channel of water coming all down along, coming down, down underneath uh, all of my uh, black ridge in that area, and it goes clear down in underneath. Well, there used to be. Yeah. There used to be, and uh, the, that's why.